Hey everyone, welcome to Thursday's Roundtable with Pastor Wes. Present and accounted for. Pastor McG McGinty. Hey. And me, I'm Matt Downing. And we are here this week. This is our Easter podcast. Yeah. So Easter's a week away, but this is the Ish. one before Easter. And so we are going to be talking about several things today. First of all, we're going to be looking at some Easter traditions. May do a little Easter trivia battle. I don't know. And um, we are going to be looking at the seven I am statements of Christ. This will lead into uh, Holy Week next week. Um, mm -hmm. We're also putting out a, devo a devotional uh, about the seven I am statements. And so, yeah, today we'll be talking through that. But you guys ready for some Easter stuff? Yeah, let's, let's do yeah. it. All right. So I need to know what are some of your Easter traditions? Mm. Jelly beans. Jelly beans. Now, you, now we e have Easter is the jelly bean season. You love if, jelly beans. If you could have yeah. any jelly bean in the yeah. world, in the world yeah. what would it be? You, like flavor or brand? Brand. Well, I think brands, you got to go with Jelly go Belly. Yeah. Sure. sure. Now, you, you said there was some kind of jelly bean from like Britain that you just Oh, uh, well, no, those are those are more more gummies. They're not jelly beans. Uh, they're okay. like gummies, but they're called Jelly Babies, and they're really good. Hey. They're really good. Yeah, I like Jelly Babies. Yeah. You know, I like a good fruit snack myself. Yeah. All right. Well, traditions. What are some things you guys do as a family? But, yeah, well, you know, do you... This is kind of a milestone for you, right, yeah, with, first, with Jesse. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we were talking earlier, and by our traditions, we have none. <laughs> it's time yes, to form some, yes. right? Yes, but yeah. as I also said pre-show, in the words of High School Musical, it's the start of something new. So, yeah, I think with, with Jesse being one, um, uh, Bethany just got her little Easter basket the other day, and so obviously we'll... Um, be out at Easter extravaganza, may do our own little... Yeah, I think this is kind of the point where we're just now, since kids are in the picture and she's not an infant, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she figuring can out what are, eggs. What, what are our traditions? What are we going to do? Uh -huh. What are... Um, I'm, I'm, I would really love to think, especially since I'm the one preaching on Easter, that maybe Easter will include a good Easter nap for all three of yeah. us. <laughs> you know, that sounds like a really good tradition. Hey, yeah. we got the Easter hammock. Yeah. You know? that, <laughs> right? Go find yeah. a creek somewhere that I can tell you a good spot or two if you need one. Yeah. Uh, but an Easter nap, that I'm, I'm down with that. Yeah. Okay, know? what's the tradition for you? Um, well, okay, one that we really enjoyed doing, this is something I grew up doing that I always loved, was we make Easter gardens. So we give like little Tupperware containers or little plaques or plate-looking things for each kid, and we go out to a lake, and they make little Easter gardens. So they put some dirt and some rocks and some little different tr twigs and flowers to make like a little garden of Gethsemane kind of thing and put yeah. some rocks together with, that looks like a tomb. And so that each kid kind of cool. makes their own little Easter garden. Cool idea. And it's a lot of fun. The kids love doing it. And it's cheapest rate. You pick a different lake each year, you go same place. We just go to Lake Flugerville. There tends to be a lot of flowers oh, yeah. there and rocks and different things to choose from and twigs and trees. Yeah. And that's it's fun. Just, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. We do... Um, of course, dying Easter eggs the day before, and then um, resurrection rolls uh, for breakfast, and then a hey. uh, big lunch and Easter egg hunt uh, at in the afternoon. Uh, we love, we always do the resurrection um, eggs uh, that tell the story of the the um, death and resurrection of Christ. Um, so that's a that's a cool thing. Our that kids cool. love our kids love doing that and taking Feel turns reading those. So. Steal some of our traditions, please. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think the hammock one that's pretty solid. <laughs> Yeah. Jesse will let you, you know, do I think it. growing up, it was interesting. Growing up, I don't know that we had a lot. I mean, we did Easter egg hunt always, mm -hmm. but I don't know that we had a lot of because I grew up in a pastor's house. So I think a lot of our tradition stuff was tied to whatever we had going on at, at church sure. and things like that. Oh, yeah, and, um, and different things. So it it's a. Uh, but she usually meant back in the day Easter pageant. Yeah, and being an Easter pageant, being in the we King's used to do entourage. those back in the day here. here I've at the never church, been but... in an Easter pageant. I'll just yeah. say that I, my life is incomplete. I guess so. Well, there were members. There's members of our church who used to be Christmas disciples. Pageants. Yeah, they used to play yeah. disciples in the uh, Easter pageant. But. Yeah, <laughs> our big deal was when you got to when you finally got to that right age range, which was like sixth, seventh grade, that you got to be in the uh, the King's entourage because you had three. Ooh. Three kings at the birth, because Easter pageant was it was birth to birth to resurrection. Right, the yeah. king's entourage. That yeah. sounds like the next. I was I was film. I was the <laughs> so the next Lord of the Rings movie. Yeah, episode, I was the, the king's uh, entourage. Blue King treasure carrier. Blue King treasure is that what it's yeah. in the script? Like blue king. Treasure no, carrier. I just know it was the blue king. Yeah, the outfits were blue, <laughs> and I helped carry the treasure that you cart in and, uh. and go there, and then you run back to costume and change into regular street clothes and. Yeah. You're a townsperson. Good You're a townsperson. Yeah. Well, well, okay, Blue King Treasure Carrier. Yeah, I uh, think give we some got Easter trivia here. A little Let's, Easter trivia. Uh, <laughs> so, 
so I guess y'all are gonna duke it out for yeah, this. Yeah. You can play along at home. Uh, how many how many chocolate Easter bunnies are made each year? Two hundred million, ninety million, seventy five million, or four hundred twenty five million? Chocolate Easter egg bunnies. Mm. Give us the numbers one more time, please. All million, two hundred, ninety, seventy five, four twenty five. Four hundred and twenty five million? Is this worldwide or is this US? It doesn't specify. It just says how many chocolate mm. Easter bunnies are made every year. I'm gonna go with four twenty five. I think that's I I guess I'll go with ninety. Oh, McGinty, you get a point. Hey, good job. Oh, nice. I don't know. That's not the right well, one. What, yeah. what, what do I need here? No. Let's see. Woo. Yeah, there we go. Point for McGinty. All right. <laughs> um, peeps, are y'all Peeps fans? No. Yeah, I'm not either. Yeah, no. I think Kids? We're three peeps strikes. fans? No. Well, they'll eat anything with sugar in it. Sure. So. <laughs> yeah, my sister loves Peeps. Too much sugar. Uh, <laughs> what is the most popular color for Peeps? Pink, blue, purple, yellow. Pink. Mm. I gotta say pink. I'm gonna go yellow. Well, the answer's yellow. Well done, Megan. Hey, oh. killing me here. Ooh, yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> That's the impressive. power of the buttons here. <laughs> I might press one for you, Matt. Uh, okay. What color were the first Easter eggs? Uh, Red, yellow, white, or green? Ooh. The first Easter eggs. Huh. All right, Matt. What you gonna go with here? Come on. Like you answer first, I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll answer off. So I'll go first, and then you can kind of. I'm gonna go with red for the symbolism. Okay, that's what I was gonna say too. Well, give you both a point because uh, it's red for the symbolism of the blood of Christ. Hey, so love it. There you go. And then a little bit of this. No, that's not right. Um, <laughs> going back to candy. Uh, what is the most popular American Easter candy? Oh wow! Marshmallow Peeps, mm. Cadbury Cream Eggs. Reese's mini chocolate Easter eggs or the aforementioned jelly beans. Oh, wow. I would say the Cadbury. You know, I want to say Cadbury egg too, but you said American, right? Yeah. And Cadbury is British. So, wow. I, I'm pretty sure it is. This. So, the, um, um, okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Reese's eggs. I'm going to go with it. Well, it's a risk. maybe at home you got the correct answer. And if you did, give yourself a point because the correct answer is actually marshmallow peeps. Oh. That's really disappointing, America. It's it really disappointing. disappointing. I'm just glad that Matt didn't get it right, too. <laughs> so, what's this? I got, we, essentially, we you got three. Get, Matt's got one. I'm maybe, sure we'll, maybe one what, more and see if I can get even. And then we'll I do I think we'll do a couple more here. Yeah. And get through this. Uh, okay. This is a good one. I actually have used this one before. Okay. Uh, in Switzerland. What animal brings the Easter eggs? Oh. Okay. Is it a vulture? <laughs> sure a not. bat? What? A fox? Or the cuckoo? Oh, cuckoo. Why would the cuckoo? I want to say cuckoo. I want to say fox. I don't know. All right. I well, mean, I guess cuckoo has actual eggs. So that makes a little more sense. But I'm but just going to agree. Bunny doesn't have eggs. This is yeah, true. Man. A bunny does not like eggs, in case you're wondering about you know your biology here. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point, Wes. Uh, so, yes. Matt, give yourself a point. It's the cuckoo. Hey, oh. all right. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, actually, we got to do a tiebreak. No, actually, he's he's ahead. I still right. have three. He has two. Yeah, I have two. Do you have any uh, more questions you got? I got a couple more. It'll be good. Okay, okay. How, how, mu how, how much did the world's largest Easter egg weigh? The world's oh, largest wow. Easter egg. Yeah, these are big numbers. Okay, how much did the world's largest oh. Easter egg weigh? Is this, this? What is this made out of? Is it made out of like uh, chocolate or paper mache? Ma made out of chocolate. Oh, yeah. oh made out of whoa. chocolate. I was gonna say, please be chocolate. Please um, chocolate. Okay, here's your options. <laughs> is there any filling? In or in order from lightest to heaviest. Okay. Uh, one thousand three hundred twenty-four pounds. One thousand. Five thousand six hundred seventy-two pounds. Oh, geez. 15,873 pounds, or did it come in at a whopping 29,224 pounds? 29,000. I'm going to go with the 5,000 ish. I'm going okay. to go, go crazy, go nuts. I'm going to go for the 29,000. Well, we'll split the difference. It's C, 15,874 pounds. Uh, neither one of us got that right. In Italy in 2011, it had a circumference of 64 feet. 3.65 inches. What year was that? 2011. Oh, 2011. Wow. No one's broken the chocolate egg Easter egg like record in over a decade. Come on, people. Uh, yeah. I'm a little disappointed there. Uh, 
Okay, so we know peeps are made of uh, of marshmallow, but what are their eyes made of? Oh. Wax, okay. brown sugar, chocolate, or caramel? Brown sugar, I think. I'm going to go chocolate. The answer is way worse than either. It's wax. What? That can't be right. That can't be right. No. Yeah, the eyes are made of... <laughs> I already knew peeps are like 50% like mystery Karna chemicals. Ubu. Karna Uba. A non-toxic edible wax, which is also found in shoe polish. So think about that when you're out there eating your peeps. (laughs) One more reason you're consuming shoe polish. Shoe polish peeps. Yeah, and we'll we'll finish out on this since we're on. Man, peeps, peeps is. I don't like peeps, but they're they're big in this quiz. Uh, How long does it take to make a peep? How long? How long? Like from factory finish start to factory like in packaging or like the time it takes to squeeze it out of whatever nozzle in the factory it's coming out of uh i think like start to finish no no, no I, don't, I don't think like no peep exists to in the package i think like an individual peep how long does it take to go from raw ingredients to okay peep? just want to know what the time frame is there all right yeah uh is it six minutes 27 minutes six hours or 27 hours what was the first one? Six minutes. Okay. 27 minutes. Six hours. 27 hours. I'm going to go six minutes. I'm going to say 27 minutes. So correct answer is six minutes. Yes. Oh, you want to. Now, <laughs> here's I'm the deal. We're going to pull the classic one more question, and if you get it right, Matt, you can <laughs> overtake him. It's right? four to what? Four to one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's overwhelming. <laughs> no, no, but I got two. You got two? Yeah. Okay. okay, it's four to yeah. two. Uh, same, same options, but in 1953... Uh, how long did it take to make one peep? 1953. 1953. They're probably making them by hand. Well, they might have some factory-ish stuff. All right, bring it. So today it's six minutes. How the, the options are the same. Six minutes, 27 minutes, six hours, 27 hours. So 1953, was it the same as today or was it different? Which one of those? To make options? one peep. One peep. Six minutes, 27 minutes. What's the third one? Six hours, 27 hours. Mm, so six. six or 27, pick minutes or hours. I would say six hours. Okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to go six hours too, because if he gets it right, the deal win. is uh, you're both wrong. It, both took, wrong. it took 27 hours to make there a single go. peep. So. Wow. And this is the society's come this a long way. This is the way. top selling candy in America. Top Easter selling candy. Easter candy. Yeah. Because uh, there's just so much of it. I don't and get it. Well, I think I've noticed this year, there's things like, like now there's different flavor peeps. Yeah. Like, are. and some of them sound re- even more. Pretty ridiculous. Yeah. I would go for a coffee peep. That might be kind of weird, but who knows? Might redeem it a little bit. Yeah, now, do exactly. I get a trophy for winning the Easter quiz or anything? Do I need to get like a think, any kind of banner? Didn't we do some kind of a, a peeps challenge last year? I, we, I promised I would bring you peeps, and I never did. Or I had to uh, eat the peeps. Like whoever t- no, I think yeah. every time we lost the question, we had to eat a peep. That's what, yeah. that's I, you know, what it was. I think. Lose thank you for not doing that too. I think. Yeah, that was the the trophy is that you successfully know why well, never to eat a peep. <laughs> there you go. The wax. The wax eyeball. Yeah. Each you get to be polish. the new Blue King's treasure carrier. Ooh, <laughs> there you yeah. go. What, the, what an honor. <laughs> I mean, you got the blue light coming up by you. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that uh, concludes our awesome trivia. Wes, thanks for it. go. That's Good one job. of the awesome things about having three people is that now oh, it's yeah, like a yeah, true competition. So and we have someone to kind of And you never read. know, man. You never know when one of you out there might, might uh, be on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, if that's still a show. You never know yeah. when one of these may. Your trivia out. may not be trivial. Who knows? <laughs> well, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back in the next five seconds, we are going to go through the seven I am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. And we're going to walk through some personal devotional application and really just be real with y'all and just share with you from our own personal lives how we think this can be applied and lived out. So we'll see you in five seconds. Don't go to anywhere. Else. All right, we are back, and uh, as we mentioned before we hit the break, we, uh, we're we real excited. This is, uh, we're coming into Easter week next week, and one of the things, church family, if you're listening to this when it's uh, when it's tossed out, when it's uh, first published, we are we are passing out Sunday a a card. If you're watching online, you can see it. I'm holding it up. If, if not, you can just imagine it. Um, but part, part of the heartbeat behind this is we, we've spent some time in our Wednesday night Bible studies, uh, especially in the last several weeks, looking at um, how you 
get in the word and and read scripture and and meet with the lord and and hear him speak and so really part of this is just trying to capitalize on easter week and helping put a resource in the hands of our church family to be in the word daily and what we've done with that is we've taken in in the gospel of john there are seven clear uh i am statements where where jesus says i am and then we'll we'll go down and walk through them and uh and and they build up um Clearly, they paint a picture of Jesus as exactly who he is, as God, and um, so just using that as an opportunity. So we thought we'd use a little bit of time on the podcast to just walk through, kind of walk through each one of those and um, and speak into those, as, uh, give a little kind of a, a different side um, than for everyone who's going to go through and read them. So uh, first I am statement comes out of John 6, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. John six, thirty five. And for the record, this, these scripture passages are we're using the CSB version. Okay. And um, I thought we using the NSAB, but it says devotional. You know, yeah. The one with the what, what do they call, you went Christian through Standard the, Bible? Yeah, the Christian Standard. Sort of the the optimal translation. Uh, yeah. So yeah. it's this new sort of approach between yeah, dynamic yeah. and. Um, Literal, what was the, the three categories of translations? Uh, it's it's dynamic off. and uh, literal is, it's, um, my, <laughs> my mind's not in that box. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to derail this conversation, but I just want to make sure yeah. you knew what translation we're Good using going, there. Daniel. So Good going. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> um, so the idea, the idea this week is, is that you read the passage and then we try to give a just at least, at least a, a question or two, a point to ponder, yeah. something to, to meditate on, to contemplate, and then uh, and and then um, a, a prayer prompt for a one way to take to take this passage and um, and to to commune with the Lord, to pray, to spend time in prayer over uh, what the Lord what the Lord claims here. And so, uh, I am the bread of life, guys. What what uh, what immediately pops out um, for y'all with with that statement? Application, yeah. Uh, you're looking at me. All yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> when I when I read that, I just I think that, about the fact that um, Jesus is the only one that can truly sustain us daily. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we the fact that He tells us that um, when we have Him, uh, we we won't be hungry again, uh, we won't thirst again, and um, I I love that. I love the the fact that He, he is He is all sufficient, and yeah. um, He meets that that deepest need that we have. Um, that longing that, that our, our soul has just to, yeah, to, to know life and to know meaning of life and contentment. So it's, I think it's really interesting that Jesus is essentially saying, just like you need to eat, just like you need to drink water, you need to drink me. Mm-hmm. Like you need to really it sounds weird, but the digest, let who I am and my character qualities and knowing who I am really become who you are you know the whole adage you are what you eat right so yeah. are you really letting jesus sustain you um you know i think of the passage where jesus was being tempted in the desert and the and satan's like hey turn these these rocks to loaves of bread and he, he tells him hey you know man does not live by bread alone right because we are spiritual beings and we need to abide in christ we need to be sustained by him uh, by drawing near to him and what does that look so my question is, Wes, what does that practically look like? What does it look like? And what's funny is I started thinking of the scene from Seinfeld where they're look, sitting at the table and one of them's like, do you yearn? <laughs> no, do you yearn? You know, like yearn, yearn, do you yearn? You know, like, do you thirst for Christ? Do you hunger yeah. for him? Like, really, do you recognize your need for him? Yeah, no. And, and I mean, I think that, I think, you know, there, there's interesting, you, you said it's kind of weird that and you, you went with the metaphor of eating and drinking, but literally that's the passage where Jesus looks at the Jews after the feeding of the 5,000 and says, I tell you, unless you eat of me and you drink of, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you have no part for me. And, he, and, and they all take it like, like, very right. face value and go cannibals. you're asking us to be cannibals and we can't and uh, they all jet too don't they oh yeah that's what i mean all of them but the but the 12 leave and um you know you think of even in that you mentioned the temptation man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of god well jesus yeah. is the word when he says i am the bread of life mm. he's not just you know the reality is when i think of bread bread is like the most basic food food group right right yeah um and we see i mean we see culture phase the bread basket we see mm-hmm. i mean um 
bread, bread, grain. It's, it's, it's in, it's in every culture you, um, and so when all of a sudden Jesus Asian is Asian culture is not as much, but it's, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. D- different grains. I mean, different rice grains of life. Yeah. But, um, you, uh, it's true. Grain. I guess you go with that. You know, rice so just fundamentally it, it's one. I, so I think practically it's uh, as a believer, it's a recognition is, do I really recognize on a belief level? Is there something sinking down that sees just like I would go, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to intentionally go without eating. I've got to eat. There's a desperation there. I've got, I've got to feel something in my body. I've got to, is there that recognition of if I am not walking in union with Christ, if I am not finding satisfaction, I think is the word yeah. that's in the contemplate point for, for that day. If I'm not finding satisfaction and if I'm not, if I'm looking for other things, even food to be the sustenance of yeah. my being, I'm still falling short from the bread of the bread of life. And, and, um, is your soul and what's starving? There. And so I think there is a question of, and I think there's a question if my, if my being does not yearn thirst and again i think we can overblow that on an emotional level if if, if especially the younger generations but we can also underplay it there should be a longing in our hearts to know to fellowship to commune to hear to walk with and if there's not then i also think practically okay well what have i what have i stuffed in the place of like how do you cultivate that desire like if that desire is not there like you don't yearn you don't thirst well then what are the things you yearn and thirst for what do you do to cultivate those well time you know time and investment time effort and i think you have to willing be willing to to, it's it's going to start with a a mental recognition and an act of will motivated by biblical faith yeah yeah. Well, the thing with this is that we're we're told that we will never be hungry or be thirsty again. Jesus is telling that, but but we are like like you said with food. Like even though we'll never hunger or thirst again, we are to be hungry for feasting on the word. You and, still have to and, choose to eat it, right? It's but not but, a it's, thing. but it's and it's an but it's an ongoing active thing where yeah. we're continuing to feast on His word and it's a good way and, it. and to to thirst after Him, even though we have Him, you know. But there's like, like as we eat, you know, we, we eat a meal, but then we're, we're hungry again later. And, yeah. um, he is, he meets those needs, but he wants us to continually seek after him and to, um, it's not a prayer so prayer and you're good to go forever. It's, right. it's, you know, a daily hour. Well, and then I think obviously on, on the big and before we move on to number two, but on the big, I mean, he's also, he's, he's really making a salvific statement there. Mm-hmm. Hey, you come to me, you come and eat of me. Yeah. You're not going to hunger again. Right. Which I think then as a believer puts to the question of, man, this isn't, this is like a promise. You eat of Jesus, you're not, you're not hungry again. So goodness, I've eaten of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Where, where, where am I not believing correctly about Jesus? Because I seem to be wandering and chasing other things for imaginary hunger. Yeah. You know, so when you feast on him, you want more, like yeah. you yeah. want, you want more of him. True. And, yeah. That's. All right, man, we got to ten minutes got, on we got one, six more. So. There you go. All right. <laughs> and there it is. We're done. Uh, I am John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, uh, but will have the light of life. You know, I think so much when you think about being in the dark, you light something up, there's this immediate contrast, you know, and what God has called us to is to reflect the light of Christ. You know, am I as is the life I'm living when it's reflecting the light of Christ, where people see a difference in the way I'm living versus the way the world chooses to live? And there's also an element of guidance there. You know, God illuminates Christ illuminates who we really are. He shows us how we can truly live in a way that's satisfying, in a way that is good for us. It's good for our relationships and good for our relationships with Him. And there's direction there. I mean, have you guys ever tried done a night hike before? Mm-hmm. And you had a flashlight, right? Like, we, I mean, sometimes you should do without a flashlight because you want to see the stars and all that kind of stuff. I get it. But it's freaky. If you've ever been stuck out in the woods yeah. without a flashlight, it's scary. There's a, there's a comfort that comes from knowing that Jesus is going to give us some direction. Mm-hmm. And as, as he is our light, I mean, he's called us to be the light and yeah. in a world of darkness. And uh, this is, 
it's a the world is a dark place right now but you know darkness cannot overtake the light light is light cuts through that darkness and um, because of christ you know we have that opportunity to, to share that light and to be that light and uh, so the, the darkness around us i mean even though it's there the light is there guiding us and and i, I think um I'm, I'll, I'll pause let you no, go. You man. guys go. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. I, I just, I, you know, I, I think the incredible reality is Don't stop this. the roller coaster in the middle of the ride, yeah. bud. <laughs> we, uh, um, Jesus being the light of the world, and he says, anyone who follows me never walk in darkness. The reality is it is the heart of God that no person be trapped in dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is wandering it? aimlessly, not, not knowing where the fear. I mean, I, there is something about darkness that is inherently fearful to us yeah. as humans and not only is darkness not as dark to god for for you know dark is not as dark to him but um psalm 139 but the, this is an incredible promise there as as a believer where we do live in dark times where sometimes we do really feel like we struggle with knowing what the direction is there's a place to sit back confidently and remember in, in this statement who jesus is is such that he wants to light where I ought to walk, like mm, yeah. he wants to light where I walk. There's there's a powerful there's, there's a, a powerful promise there. To there's rest a great in. commission aspect to this as well. You know, think to bring in the whole aspect of it's not just personal; it's global. You know, mm. uh, I'm the light Absolutely. of the world. We Christ desires for everyone of all tongues yeah. and all nations to to have that direction to come out of darkness to come into that marvelous light. I think there's a worship song. I think it's actually based on a, a psalm too. Um, that's his desire for all of us, of yep. all people, and to be a part of bringing that light to other people. Um, and if the world would accept his his light, man, it'd be a much different place. No mm-hmm. doubt. We got to keep trucking. Number three. Uh, number three comes from John 10. It says this, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me or who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture i am the gate for the sheep so definitely not one that probably is as readily uh some cultural significance is missing uh, from from it for us as yeah we, i mean are you shepherd man um, last i checked no no um, i mean not in the <laughs> i'm asking literally i guess we're all sort of pastoral shepherds you know <laughs> but, um, no but for sure i think out of all seven statements this is probably the one that is the most culturally distant from us because yeah. we're not None of us, very few of us, are true agricultural hands. But, but the idea is that the the sheep would be in that pen. Yep. And uh, the shepherd would lay across the gate so that no uh, predator or robber or he he was the line of defense protecting the safety of the flock. And so for Jesus to say, look, anyone who's come before, they've been. They want to steal you. They want to kill you. Right. Um, but I, I, I am the gate. Which is really fascinating because you read this, you think, okay, again, a gate is about entry. Right? So you think, oh, Jesus is the entry to heaven, which is true. But this this illustration is really, the point of it is being standing between us yeah, he's, and hell. He's the... And between those a, who want to take us away. A protector. Yeah, I was going to say he's a fierce protector. Like, um, I think about a parent and I think about... Uh, you know, we, we don't know what being a shepherd is all about, but we we are like shepherds for our family. We in in corralling our kids and protecting our kids. You know, we, you know, we we very fiercely want to protect them from from you know thieves and robbers and, yeah. and any, anyone that would um, harm them, uh, whether it be physically or emotionally, mentally. And so, you know, Jesus tells us that that I I am the gate that um, I, I'm. I want to protect you. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. And he's, so he's the only one, the only one that can rescue us, the only one that can protect yeah, us. Yeah, there's the protection. And, and, and again, actually, I think it is there because it goes on and says, if anyone enters by me, it's, the gate is both the entrance yeah. and mm-hmm. the protection. That's right. And yeah. so how do, how do you get into the flock? He's the access. Christ. Right. Christ is the way into the flock. And once you're in the flock, how do you how do you have the guarantee to come, in, come and go and find Say, you know, the idea of find pasture is to find safety. Yeah. Because he's the protector. Mm-hmm. And finding pasture makes me think of um, Psalm 23. And obviously, this segues oh, into sure. the, the, the next, next I am statement, yeah. which is part of the same passage. Um, but is that, you know, he, he, he um, leads me beside still waters. He, he brings mm-hmm. me into um, 
pastures of peace mm-hmm. um, is is that you know so many of us in 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 our spirit the waters are turbulent and the land is dry mm-hmm. yeah there's we, a really feel attack but then here's Jesus saying what's the way to waters of rest to pastures of peace it's me yeah uh, I'm the one oh, you shepherd. enter into I'm the one who protects that and I think what this really harkens to is really a key connection to the Old Testament where one God would also criticize the leaders of the Old Testament, you know, say they are bad shepherds. Yeah. You know, God is, you know, ultimately the, the great shepherd that is leading. Isaiah kind of talks about this a little bit. And um, and so God's chief promise to the Israelites was, I want to provide for you and I want to protect you. You must worship and obey me. And so here Jesus in this one illustration is making the same promise. I want to provide for you, safe, you know, a place to eat and to dwell but I also want to protect you. I want to be the one there. So it's hearkening back to the exact same promise at Mount Sinai in many ways, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I love that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Wes. No, no, go for it. Go for I was it. Just saying, I, I love what he says there in, in John um, in 10 verse 11, that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Like he yeah. loves his sheep and is such a fierce protector that he is willing to die for them. Hey, that's window. number four. Have we read that one yet? Yeah, that's what we're on. No, we hadn't read it yet, but, but we oh, were going there. I thought we were already so. on number four. You jumped the gun there, man. <laughs> no. What Matt's referring to is, is is the fourth I am statement is, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. John 10, 11 and 10, 14. Yeah. So I've already done it. No, no, <laughs> no I, I love that. I love that because, uh, again, it goes it goes back to what we're saying, that, um, that, that he, as our shepherd, uh, that he's willing to lay down his life. He loves us that much. And I love the last part of that verse too, where it says, um, I know my own and, and my own know me. How do, how does sheep know their shepherd? Because he, he is so fiercely protective of them. They look to him as, as their, their salvation, their rescuer. And, uh, that's when, you know, when you go over, if you ever get to go to, um, to Israel, uh, there is somewhere near Nazareth, there is um, a reconstructed uh, first century village. And you can go into that village and it'll give you a really good visual picture of what, what, a, what a village looked like, what first, you know, first century rural Jewish homes were like. And, and in that village, there are shepherds and they have sheep. And they will show and demonstrate part of hmm. this reality that a sheep, one, um, a sheep in scripture is always the dumbest animal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But incredibly valuable, though, at the same Va- time. Incredibly valuable. Because, I mean, how, how do you count your riches? Well, how big's your flock? Yep. Right. But incredibly dumb and defenseless. A sheep, a sheep is not the intelligent animal. A sheep is not, it has no natural defense. A sheep's ability uh, for defense, for protection, it goes back to the shepherd. But one thing with the sheep is every sheep has a name. Yeah. And you'll watch the shepherd in this village, call them by name, mm. and they will come to the shepherd. You'll call them by name. They don't pay attention to you. They know the voice right. of their shepherd. God knows us. Yeah. And and when we become in Christ, the reality is um, God knows his own. We know him. And I mean, there's just imagery. I think I think of times when I've, when I've sat back and, and felt the weight of being in pastoral ministry where we are shepherds. Mm-hmm. And then you read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And and just times where, and I think it's still something I I process in in full reality of just like I, you know, I think of the way that I can have, I'm going to shepherd, I want to shepherd people to the Lord and, and all of this. And, and, and all of a sudden then, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. Not just mine as a pastor. Under shepherds. uh, But the Lord, any believer, the Lord is their shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He's the one who who leads, who guides, who protects, who corrects, That's good. who, I mean, there's just a really, really fall and, and process that there's, there's a lot there for him to say, I am the good yeah. shepherd. In many ways, as pastors, we're under shepherds, but we're also sheep as well. Oh, because we think in terms of, you know, serving as a shepherd, the implication, we don't want people to think is like, okay, if we're the shepherd, then the people in the church are the sheep. <laughs> and it's, oh, no, you no, know, no. we're all, we're all sheep in some ways, right? Dumb. We're all <laughs> spiritually broken in that sense. Um, but God has called us to be under shepherds, to lean into him and, and to serve in, in unique ways. But I think the power of knowing that Christ knows me is just incredibly amazing. What's also cool about this analogy, about calling his own, every shepherd for his flock has a unique calling. 
Mm. So there'd be a lot of times there'd be one watering hole and different group, different flocks would come to the same watering hole, but the shepherd could you do his unique calling and his group of sheep would leave. And so each shepherd had their own unique call for their, their flock. And I think that has several layers. One, do I know Jesus' call in my life? And do I know what he wants for me to do and how he has built me and designed me to serve? The second thing is, do I know Jesus' voice? Hmm. When I read scripture, when I spend time praying, do I know his voice? And by that, I don't necessarily mean like, hey, you hear an audible, whatever. No, that might happen. That's rare. And God does that sometimes. But I think God directs our thoughts. When he directs your thoughts, do you recognize the Holy Spirit directing your thoughts and what he's prompting you to do? Right. And I think that as as dumb sheep, when we tend to not do that, when we tend to not read his word and pray, um, then it, we, we talked about knowing the voice of the shepherd. Um, it's so easy for us to be confused when we're not seeking God because the voice of the oh, sure. voice of the world is so strong that the voice, the voices that are out there. And before long, if we listen to those voices and we don't listen to our shepherd's voice, then we, that's where we get confused. And we're like, oh, I just don't, you know, I don't know. Is this really what I'm supposed to do? And God provides clarity. God provides direction as the good shepherd, and and we've got to be seeking him and listening for that instruction. Well, it came at a great cost. I mean, laid down his life for us to be able to have this with him. And and there's great there's great imagery there of um, where is a shepherd leading sheep? Out in the wilderness. Yeah. Um, where there's time, where it's not hurry and bustle, where it's alone, where it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. God does his where best work in the wilderness. You know, we... Um, we sometimes miss really hearing his voice because we live so busy and hurried yeah, that's right. that we miss, whereas, whereas that's there. And then, you, you know, you've got the reality of a shepherd leads, a shepherd guides, and he says, I'm the good shepherd. So one of the questions on who do I trust his leading? Yeah. Well, part of the deal that comes back for us on a practical level is if he's the good shepherd, then do we really believe that where he leads is good? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even if it's hard, even if it's frightening, even if it, but where he leads is good. And, and ultimately here's the thing. He's not just leading to good, but if for a moment you go, well, how do I know this is really good? Because this shepherd, he laid down his life to yeah. lead you to his Because good. of the I cost, mean, there's, there's a, good. so much there. And it's like the whole Disney adage that drives me nuts, follow your heart, Yeah. right? Follow your heart. Well, that's poor leading, right? It's wishy-washy. We've addressed that some in the podcast too, but there's a lot of progressive Christianity right now that I've watched this really fascinating video about where basically Jesus is this bobblehead. Like, yes, that's a good idea. Just kind of agrees with whatever we want yeah. to do. And the question that I thought was really good that if someone has this perspective, let's say I'm a Christian, but I think Jesus kind of agrees with whatever I say things are. Ask him, does God have the right to say what your heart tells you to do is wrong? Does God have the right to tell your dreams are broken, that what your heart is leading to do is not good? Mm. Because ultimately, the because Jesus laid down his life, his leading can be trusted and it's worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. All right, we got like, not to do the hurry and the rush, we got like basically three, four minutes to do these last three. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, John, John 11, awesome chapter. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, looks at Mary in the midst of her grief, says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And, and obviously there's a there's a powerful statement there for our etern- eternal aspect, right? If, if, I, if I believe in him, he's the resurrection and the life. Even, if, even though my physical body dies, I will yet live. But here's the real kicker. Like he doesn't say, I will be your resurrection. He says, I am. Am. Like yeah. I am the resurrection. I, I am now. This is not something you know that you look off far into the future for. It's something to experience and know. And it was a huge now. statement too, because the Jewish people at the time they thought the resurrection was a series of people rising. They didn't realize the resurrection was one person. Yeah, that's what really caught them off guard. So for Jesus, to say, I am the resurrection. That would have been a total gear shift in their understanding. Yeah. Um, you know, if Jesus can rise from the dead, He can raise my soul from the dead. He can raise, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about being dead before Christ. I'm spiritually dead. I need Jesus to raise me to life. Yeah. The resurrection is both physical and metaphysical. It shows us that if he can raise a body to life, he can raise our broken, sin-riddled soul and our desires to life and to be awakened into that new creature. 
And I think that's, that's powerful because our culture tells us you are the divine. You can transform yourself from the inside out. If you just yeah. read the right self-help books or you just, you know, follow your heart or just, you know, cut the negativity out of your life or whatever, then you can transform yourself from the inside out. The problem is if you are broken, you can't fix yourself. Yeah. And then, and obviously there's the, the, there's the incredible, powerful truth of just, um, uh, not just there's the, there's the bring to life a dead soul, but there's the, um, in salvation. But then there is a truly the hope for future for us who are in Christ of, um, he is the resurrection and the life. We will, yep. we will be raised. But, uh, that leads us life. Uh, I, by the most common one that everyone knows of the I am statements, I am the way I am the truth and I am the life. Kind of the catch all. No one comes to the father except through me. And obviously we see an exclusivity there. Yeah. You can't get to God except through Jesus. It's not always leads to God. There's not multiple paths up the mountain. There's one path. Christ. Japan, there's this Japanese parable that says all roads lead to the top of Mount Fuji. <laughs> and it's, it's sort of their approach to a lot of, you know, it's very postmodern, yeah. you know, um, but the problem will, a lot of roads lead to a lot of crazy places. They don't all, you know, there's yeah. only one road that leads to the top. And just, you know, I, when I, when I hear that, what comes to mind is one, the exclusivity of salvation, but yeah. two, um, when it comes as believers, like if we really want to know real life, if we really want truth to God, it is going to be found and pressing into Christ because yeah. he himself is the truth. Christ life. alone. Like there yeah. is that, that word, the, in, in yeah. several times and that, that, that is crucial. What like, do you mean by the, right? There's, <laughs> it's, he's not a way. He's not a truth. Is that option he is the way, the truth. And then no one can come to the father except through him. So, um, you know, I, I, I share this with our students all the time that, you know, in, in my house, there's one key that gets you into the door. Um, no, no matter how many keys you may try, there's one key that will get into my door and I have it. Yeah. And so in order for you to be able to come to my house, I either have to let you in or you have to have my key. And Jesus is telling us that there is no way to the father except through him. He is the way into that life. So yeah. and it's hard to dwell on that in our particular culture where everyone's sort of smorgasbord oh, of what they yeah. believe. And for us yeah. to say, listen, there's one way. Is one way, but what's the alternative for someone to say, yeah, Jesus is a great person. That's good for you. But okay. His death has to mean something. Yeah. If, if Jesus died just for option three and two B and God was like, yeah, that's great. That makes God a horrible person. Like if there was mm-hmm. any other way for there to be salvation, I'm sure God would have taken it, but it was the only way. And he was yeah. willing to lay down your life for you. So if someone's willing to lay down their life for you because it's the only way I think he's worth listening to. Absolutely. Especially when he is objectively the truth in the life. Uh, yeah. So what, he would what's, know. The last, what's the last one? Last one, John 15. Uh, I am the true vine. My father's the gardener. I'm the vine. You are the branches, the one who remains in me. And I and him produce as much fruit because you can do nothing without me. This is the great passage about you and I as believers. The only way, the secret to following Christ is abiding in him. Which is missing from this translation. Yeah, most of the translations I've read like use the word abide, which comes yeah, from the word they, they've abode, translated like, it. Make your home with yeah, Christ. they've translated remain uh, instead of abide. So I wonder uh, why that is. Do you know? Uh, the word the word means to remain, to 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 dwell in a place, to remain, to linger, to dwell. to stop, to okay. abide. It it just has a range, and I think probably since remains is a little used a little more commonly in English today than abide. Yeah, that's, what that's true. We don't say abide very often. Yeah. But, um, but I he, like the imagery of it yeah. because abiding, you're living in, remaining, I think of the word stay, you know, but yeah. to, to live uh, in Christ. And um, and the great secret yeah. of abiding, just because we're about to hit our time cap here, <laughs> is uh, for those of you listening and watching, the great secret of abiding is learning how to truly live in daily restful faith. Yep. And not just daily, finding times where you can carve out a bigger chunk of time to really soak you yeah. know, um, Dallas Willard said trying to do daily devotions for a couple minutes every day is like trying to get a shower with just one drop of water at a time. Yeah. When I think abiding, though, goes beyond just even devotion. It's truly learning how to linger in a posture of restful faith yeah. moment by moment, day by day. And that's True. that's the key. Well, we are out of time, according to the video camera, but we're going to go ahead and close this thing out because we still got the audio and we're going to pray this out. And um, um Matt, real quick, <laughs> you want to double tap the camera so we have some film going in a second. <laughs> we have some audience. If you're watching this and you're like, oh, I don't see anything for this right now, but I still hear it. It's just because our camera um, overheats and has to be restarted. So uh, still listen and follow the sound of our voices. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> so now you got a picture again. We're still with you. Um, 
So closing this out, we talk about, you know, abiding in Christ. There's this imagery of a tree, but also if we're close to Christ, we're going to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, we're going to take on the qualities of Christ. Am I producing the qualities of Christ? Am I committing myself to draw? Well, and the great, the great imagery there is it's not, am I producing? It's, yeah. The branches yeah. don't produce anything. Right. It's, it's, it's the key, vine key that's producing through you. What we're doing is we're abiding, we're, we're remaining, we're, we're posturing in faith. We are resting. Now, certainly when, when the vine issues a command, then, then by that, by that power of the spirit, we, we walk in obedience, but, but it's the spirit producing. It's another great part of this imagery is I am the true vine. My father's the gardener. Yeah. Which the, what's the gardener do? The gardener comes and, and he prunes, he prunes it's a scary wastefulness, thought. he Sobering. prunes uh, a usefulness, he prunes, which, which means that we should never be discouraged by pruning in our life. Yeah. Because that's that's how you grow a greater, more fuller, more more more. Well, I think like a bonsai tree, crop. it's like been pruned to look a specific way in the yeah. hands of Mr. Miyagi. Um, a little karate kid reference there for you, but I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. There's a passage I think it's in Isaiah where he talks about trees planted close to the water. Um, maybe yeah, it's a um, Help that, me out here. well, no, maybe you're thinking of, uh, I think Jeremiah 17, yeah, Jeremiah. Yeah. where he's talking about the, um, blesses the man who trusts in the Lord for he should be like a tree planted near a stream of water mm. who, uh, in the season of drought won't, won't dry up, won't cease producing fruit, won't. Um, and it's in contrast to the man who trusts his heart because the heart is deceitful above all things. And may wander out into the wilderness, which that imagery is so powerful for us, especially in the hill country area. Because you go to like springs or creeks and the trees are just massive by those creeks. We were out by Chalk Ridge Falls uh, near um, Salado, just beautiful waterfall and creeks. And the trees, they have these massive trees right there planted by the water. Yeah. You walk away from the water, further out the trees are smaller, a little more scraggly and whatnot. Uh, but God wants us to flourish, and I think the closer we are to Christ, the more we're going to flourish. Yeah, completely. It's a powerful imagery. Well, we're excited, church family, about about Easter week, about what this holds. Excited for the things that are going on this week. Yeah, and, and hope this will be a just a just a good resource again. It's it's all part of I think just helping helping direct our uh, the the eyes of our heart, the eyes of our mind, the eyes mm-hmm. of our will upward above to the Lord to to meditate, to chew on, and reach you, and reach you, and reach you, and in that way. Um, work practically at, at what we're ultimately doing internally, which is seeking to abide in Christ. And so we hope this has been an encouragement to you. And yes. uh, if you got any questions, feel free to contact us. Con- hit, uh, hit, send us pers- D- DMs, personal messages, shoot us an email, yeah. grab yeah. us at church. Yeah, yeah. Um, We normally Let close it out in prayer, but <laughs> we can, uh, do you want to still close out in prayer? Then we can do our little um Oh, the call sign. Yeah, yeah, look at me. Pastor doesn't have, I don't have a clue how, the, how we. It's how okay. We, <laughs> We're stuff. still trying to train so, him how to do this podcast yeah. thing, but it's okay. I'm 33 and made for not the 21st century. <laughs> kidding. Hey, no, dude, we can totally pray. Matt, why don't you, why don't you pray for us and you then bet. we'll, we'll yeah. go forward. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. And God, thank you for sending your son for us. Mm-hmm. We are uh, so thankful for all that, that Jesus is and what he has done for us lord we want to um just say that we acknowledge these these i am statements lord we Mm -hmm. we don't just acknowledge that you said them but lord we uh we claim them and and um lord they are they are truth they are uh, they're foundational for us because this affects how we how we see you and not just how we see you but how we follow you and so lord remind us continually um throughout our days lord that that you are our good shepherd and that you are the light and that um, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, as we live in a world of chaos, as we live in a world of darkness and confusion, God, may we listen to your voice and may, yes, we, may we press into you so that we can know your voice uh, amidst all the chaos. We know our enemy, um, he, is, um, he, he works to confuse us, he works to deceive us, and Father, if we are not connected to you, Lord, if we're not abiding you in you, Lord, we're going to fall for his lies. So Father, we want to walk rightly, we want to listen to you, and Lord, we want to bear fruit. So Lord, would you um, would you produce your fruit in us? Would you take away the things that need to be taken away? Mm. And uh, as you as you prune us and make us more into what you want us to be, and Father, may we uh, may we may we celebrate this Easter. Um, recognizing all you've done and all you are for to us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now 
If you got any questions, prompts. contact us. <laughs> there you go. You got that part down. Please, seriously, contact us. Leave us uh, some comments about your thoughts or application of these seven IM statements. And uh, Matt, where can they listen to us? Like the, you know, the places out there that they can listen to us. That's real specific. Uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple. Be, yeah. Uh, I heard someone today saying you can, you can find us on the podcasts. You can find us on the <laughs> podcast, all the podcast yeah. platforms. Yeah, that's not, but I'm like, we're, they're already listening to us on a podcast platform. Or but, they may be watching on Facebook or YouTube. We're right. the majority of this sometimes. If you want to share, to. Uh, which we'd love for you to do. Hey, each is about sharing, right? Share the good news of Christ. Share this and maybe it'll encourage somebody. Maybe people listen to this podcast all over and um, help us do that. Sounds anyway, good. we'll see you next time. In. Bye. Bye.